I now look to James Dix, Chair of the Consultative Committee, Christchurch, to open the case for the opposition. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, before I begin my argument for the opposition tonight, I would like to say my piece on one issue by way of an introduction. On the 22nd of June 2016, my life was as follows. I'd just finished studying for my AS level exams, in particular my British politics exam, and I had a job at my local swimming pool where I was lifeguard and swimming teacher. It was a nice way to contribute to the economy. I would turn 18 in just under a year. Now, had the House of Lords amendment to give me franchise in the next day's referendum not been defeated by the House of Commons the year before, I would have been able to vote in the 2016 EU referendum. By the time I reached 18, just a mere 11 months later, my life was as follows. I had just finished studying, this time for my A-level exams. I had the same job at my local swimming pool, and I was still contributing to the economy. <laughs> I had just turned 18. I was in the exact same position, with the exact same maturity, as I had been in the previous year. I would have then been allowed to vote. I was told by my representatives, sitting in that other great debating chamber, and one sitting in this chamber tonight, that despite my job, despite my studying the British Constitution, that because I had not yet reached the age of 18, I was not going to be able to have my say on a decision that would affect me for the majority of my lifetime. My story is shared with a few people in this chamber, and I hope I am at least conveying some of the indignation people of my age feel at the fact that our Parliament chose not to follow in the footsteps of the Scottish independence referendum and give 16 and 17 year olds the vote. But I suppose that's all water under the bridge, and I can stand here and have my voice heard, in fact on equal footing with someone who voted against me giving my voice two years ago. But I know most of you haven't come here to hear me speak today, and that probably includes my parents as well. <laughs> so it is truly my honour to introduce to you, Mr President, the proposition speakers tonight. We've just heard a rousing support of the deal from the delightful Amber Seward, a second year PPE student at Magdalen College and the Chief of Staff here at the Oxford Union. Amber is not just any PPE student. Amber achieved the highest results in her year for her first year exams. And yet tonight she is so astoundingly wrong that it is almost out of character. I know it is difficult for her to be on the opposite side to her greatest political idol tonight. Someone that shares her views on the people's vote, social policy and foreign policy. The Honourable Guest, Mr Nigel Farage. <laughs> Joking aside, Amber has saved me countless times this term, and I wouldn't have survived without all of her help. The union is losing a wonderful individual and a real friend. Henry Newman is the director of Open Europe, a non-partisan and independent policy think tank researching into the United Kingdom's relationship with the EU. Open Europe thoroughly stresses its independence and its practical approach to issues. It moves itself away from party politics and tries to approach Brexit in a new and refreshing way. Henry Newman was also the Conservative parliamentary candidate for the North Tyneside 2017 general election and a former special advisor to Michael Gove. <laughs> Independence is key, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Nicholas Lear is an MPhil history student at Lincoln College and the current secretary of the Oxford Union. And he is also an editor at the Oxford Political Review. I'd never heard of it either. <laughs> Nick has been one of the best secretaries this union has had. His socials have gone down amazingly with the members. His announcement of the debate specials of we've all just witnessed will go down in history. And his ball was the biggest and fastest selling ball the union has ever hosted. Ever? Thank you. <laughs> I know there have been tensions between Nick and Dan along the way, but I know it's really just because you two are both so similar. Far-right fascists. <laughs> Finally, we have Rory Stewart, MP. Rory is the Minister of State for Prisons, serving in Theresa May's cabinet, and has become a real vocal advocate and defender of the Brexit deal. It is actually quite difficult to say something bad about Rory. Apart from when he accidentally made up a Brexit statistic on Five Live, it appears as though in every role he's taken on, he's fully committed himself and sought after solutions to problems. In fact, someone in my family worked for DEFRA when Rory was the Minister for the Environment, and he has always maintained that Rory really got stuck into every area. And yet he's willing to be in the same party as legendary Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson. So it really is baffling. 
<laughs> These are your guests, Mr. President, and they are most welcome. <laughs> to the motion at hand, this House supports the deal. Now, why would someone support the deal? I'll be putting forward, forward three main reasons why someone would support the deal and then analysing the deal through the prism of each reason. So firstly, someone could support a deal because it honours the result of the referendum. Secondly, that deal could ensure a stable union. And thirdly, it could provide economic freedom and prosperity. So first, to the phrase honouring the result of the referendum. Well, what was the result of the referendum? Well, the question was as follows. Should the United Kingdom remain a member of the European Union or leave the European Union? Two options, remain, leave. The result, as we all know, 52% to leave. That's it. That's all we know. Anyone who tries to tell you that they know for certain that everyone who voted to leave did so wholly because of immigration or because of anger at the establishment or because of a bureaucratic Brussels is lying to you. There are so many factors different to each and every individual that led to their vote to leave. What this subsequently means is that each and every individual has a different idea of what their vote meant. Because the verb to leave was left undefined, people filled it with their own definitions. I'm sure my Brexit-supporting friends, rel relations, neighbours, didn't all agree on whether or not to leave Euratom. And yet we are. I bet most did not even know what Euratom was. I hadn't a clue. Therefore, they each have different ideas about what the word leave means in the context of Euratom. I'm sure they didn't all agree on how to deal with PET passports or the transfer of radioactive isotopes used in cancer treatments or how to deal with the regulation of seeds after we leave the common agricultural policy. In fact, I would commend the Brexiteers on both sides of the aisle tonight if they can tell me exactly what it means to have left the European Union. It is futile to attempt to honour the result of the referendum in any way other than to ensure a change in our current relationship because the referendum was so hopelessly undefined. I am in fact sure that the Honourable Guest speaking last for the opposition this evening or stand up and say that this deal does not leave to the extent he would like to leave. It is too soft, it's not really leaving at all. And I'm also certain that the Honourable Guest speaking last for the proposition will stand up and say that the deal does leave to the extent that he would like to leave. The real arguments about the deal do not lie in whether or not we have sufficiently left the European Union, or whether this deal truly honours the result of the referendum. They instead lie in the discussions about the future of our union and the economic future of this country. Therefore, I will now turn to the other two reasons to support a deal and show why May's deal cannot possibly meet these standards. Let's begin with a deal that ensures a stable union, first looking at Ireland and the backstop. Under the deal, if the British and the EU fail to reach an agreement which keeps the border open, then the backstop comes into force. The UK enters a single customs territory, whatever the hell that means, with the EU. However, Northern Ireland alone remains aligned to some extra rules of the EU single market, single market to ensure a border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland remains open. Now, a recent poll found that 40% of Irish citizens believe that the backstop would make Irish unity more likely. But the key thing from this poll is that it was 67% of under 35s who stated that a backstop would make Irish unity more likely. The future leaders of Ireland the under 35s generation see Irish unity as becoming likely under an implemented backstop. And yet the deal in its current form will have this backstop ready as an insurance policy. Furthermore, it's hard to see how when we get to the real meat of the negotiations, the future relationship, a deal is going to be struck that avoids any border in Ireland. This would completely threaten the foundational basis of the Good Friday Agreement, an agreement which has largely kept Ireland in peace after decades of death and anguish. I hope I do not have to remind some of the honourable guests that the party they officially support is called the Conservative and Unionist Party. <laughs> <laughs> Theresa May could come back, of course, with her alternative arrangement as mandated by Parliament. But again, what would, what would this be? Now, the simple phrase technology has been suggested, and we've been implored to look at the border between Norway and Sweden. Now, that border is one of the most technologically advanced in the world. And yet, at the main border crossing, I'm not going to try and pronounce it because my Norwegian is terrible. Norwegian Customs says it processes about 1,300 lorries every day, each one taking 20 minutes. 
A senior Swedish customs officer who wrote a report for the European Parliament said that technology alone could not eliminate the need for checks at the Irish border and that the success of the Sweden-Norway border relies on high levels of trust and similar product standards. Yet surely this would completely infringe on our newfound Brexit freedom to import chlorinated chicken. Or we could move customs checks away from the border. Yet last year, North Ireland's chief constable, George Hamilton, warned of the risks that custom officers could face. He said whether, on, whether that be HMRC, whether that be people engaging in checking of standards and products, I think it is highly foreseeable that they will become the subject of threat. The no. <laughs> Sorry, Brian. The final suggestion, a time limit on the backstop, defeats the very purpose that May is trying to put this backstop in place, and it kicks the can further down the road. And I hope that everyone in this room understands the supreme importance of keeping the Irish border open, as open as possible. I hope that everyone understands that risking another 3,500 lives is completely unacceptable. Two days ago, the Welsh National Assembly voted to support a motion of opposition to the deal in its current form. And on the very same day, the Scottish Parliament voted to support the exact same motion of opposition to the deal. In the 20 years of devolution, this is the first joint measure, uh, motion ever passed by the devolved legislatures. If the government has any respect for the devolved bodies of this nation, which are now firmly, firmly rooted in the constitution of this country, then it will listen to what they have to say. It is no secret that the current Scottish First Minister is a fervent believer in the independence of Scotland. And whilst I am a vehement supporter of Scotland remaining part of the United Kingdom, I think we can all see an appeal of the independence movement to the EU favouring majority in Scotland. Again, this is a risk that should not be run by the UK government. Finally, I will turn to the economic prosperity that could be offered by this deal. Uh, long story short, there isn't any. Uh, official figures from Theresa May's government say that the, UK could be up to three point, the UK's economy could be up to 3.9% smaller after 15 years under the deal compared with staying in the EU. The London School of Economics, an inferior university but good with statistics, suggests that the, <laughs> suggests that the Brexit deal could reduce UK GDP per capita by between 1.9% and 5.5% within 10 years. As to economic freedom, for the two-year transition period, Britain remains entirely a rule maker and not a rule taker, sorry, and not a rule maker. Yes, we can begin to negotiate our wonderful trade deals with the rest of the world, but they cannot be implemented until after the future relationship negotiations are over. I now return to those three fundamental criteria which I set out at the start of my argument. Honouring the results of the referendum, ensuring a stable union, and providing economic freedom and prosperity. The issue is that the trifecta of fundamental agreement are mutually exclusive. It is not possible to honour the Leave vote and have economic prosperity and a stable union. Parliament has to accept this and decide which of those three criteria it is willing to uphold. A no-deal Brexit is the cleanest Leave, but shatters the UK economy and risks reigniting the troubles. The deal which we are debating in this House tonight does not provide that clean leave, but by every forecast makes the nation poorer and still risks reigniting the troubles. That is why the only way forward is to vote against this deal for an extension of Article 50 and to support a softer Brexit which values the economic prosperity and stability of the Union over a futile attempt to honour a result which we cannot define. This is why I urge you and I implore you to vote for the opposition tonight. Thank you.